Welcome to Nugget 209 with Steve Groman. Today we will be going back to the evolutionist magazines. This will be the Scientific American, October 2021. Our latest issue that we got in the mail. Yes, we did. I was telling Steve last night as I went through this magazine, I think we could do a nugget on every, every single page, page <laughs> every even page. the ads. Yeah. It's just yeah. incredible. But we have never done one from the from the editor section. This one is Laura Helmuth. She is the editor-in-chief of Scientific American. It was her editorial called Big on Birds. The article starts off, Birds have been a great source of joy for many of us at Scientific American. They are for me too. I know. Sometimes it's like, are we getting that old that we enjoy bird watching? <laughs> That's kind of scary, We're not right? really official avid bird watchers, but man, they're fun to watch. Right. <laughs> we've done so a nugget beautiful. and shown you the beautiful birds yesterday. in the lower Rio Grande Valley. Even just yesterday, we saw some cool looking birds. Yes, we did. We went to an ostrich farm and we will take you there on a Saturday travel and history tip to the ostrich farm where we fed lorries and people parakeets and it was a whole bunch of crazy and fun. ostrich and ostrich yes that you, was the you, main you didn't feature. like them you didn't like them so no, they hurt <laughs> they they didn't bite but their beaks are hard they are hard but that'll be a while anyway we've been working at home during the pandemic and paying more attention to the wildlife in our neighborhood and now we take walks during the mornings and evenings rather than commuting during the best birding hours of the day seth fletcher who runs our features department was entertained recently by a carolina wren shrieking like a dinosaur ancestors well that was the part of this article that struck my fancy. Yeah, and we've heard that kind of thing. That's one of the reasons they say birds are dinosaurs. We've heard that just the last few weeks. We have been traveling basically from Washington State to Arizona and then on to Texas. We have stopped and seen some beautiful sights, and we have heard donkeys, crows, horses, yes. cows, and they all sound like dinosaurs. Yeah, if you don't see them, you just hear some sound. It's like, oh, wow, that's... Yeah, we were just walking out in the desert or actually at the church we were parked at last week. The people behind the church, they have some donkeys. And as we're cleaning the car, it's like, that is a dinosaur. Of course, (laughs) when he got into the typical E-R-E-R stuff, it was like, yeah, it's a donkey. You can tell that this is where they got the sounds from to make the movies. And that doesn't mean the birds or the donkeys used to be dinosaurs. It just means that they are using the sounds of these animals to to portray what dinosaurs... Because no one knows what a dinosaur sounds like. No, it's all conjecture based on what they believe it is or was. Art director Mark Mrak sees wild turkeys strut through his yard. We do too. Christine Kalin, who handles customer service, noticed the ridiculous variety of songs Northern Cardinals belt out. I suction cupped a feeder to my office window and often have a white-breasted nuthatch fly in during video meetings, make its grouchy call, and leave with a peanut. Well, this all sounds kind of silly. There's a lot of things we could talk about. It's like, why are these people still working at home, number one? I think they've gotten used to that. Our society has gone through such a change in the last year and a half that I'm not sure people will ever go to work. When I did work in an office, that was was part of the deal. That's part of the fun, to go to work. Right. Kate Wong, an editor who specializes in evolution, got bit by the birding bug last year and has been sharing gorgeous photos of osprey, Baltimore Orioles, lots of warblers, and even a vagrant roseate spoonbill she bagged in Connecticut. And we've seen all those. Yes, we have. She met up with some extreme birders this spring for the wildest side of birding, a big day in which teams race across a set territory to identify as many bird species as they can in 24 straight hours. We've seen groups that are doing that too. Just not too long ago, they were trying to find as many as they could find. Like, and wow. then I remember one time we were in the Everglades, all these people were packed around and they were like, oh, it's a, I can't remember what it's called. I'll try and look that up. They were so excited because I guess it only <laughs> went there very rarely. But anyway, birds Birders do get excited. And they are beautiful creatures, no question. The article goes on and starts talking about there possibly is a fifth force of nature and all kinds of crazy things. That's not the point of why we wanted to talk to you about that today. It's because they say that the dinosaurs are now the birds. Right. And we just want to point out that, no, God created everything and it's to reproduce after its own kind. And it's because they have feet somewhat the same or the tracks that are left from the dinosaurs somewhat the same as a bird. And And again, the noise like we've just discussed earlier. And there may be some similarities. That's okay. That doesn't mean they used to be each other. No, we can all screech and make different noises and different animals can sound similar. We do agree that some of the birds do sound exactly like how they depict the dinosaurs. Right. And again, they don't know what the dinosaurs sounded like. They are just using animals that we have today to make those sounds. So it's a backwards interpolation almost. Is that how you can yeah, say that? Yeah, I don't, 
out. I say it in our meetings. I have uh, examples of it, and I should actually spend a fair amount of time on it. I think we even did a nugget on it. If dinosaurs are actually the birds, they had to learn to fly. And that would be an incredible feat, would it not? It would be an incredible feat. There are two options, and they're both foolishness, but why don't you go ahead and tell them what they say and how they say that dinosaurs got wings and transitioned and evolved into birds. Yeah, it's uh, not exactly quite science to say that, to come to this conclusion, but that's not what they quite do. quite science. It's not science at all. <laughs> no, it's a, a lot of what evolutionists do, not science at all. It's not observable and testable and repeatable and all that. But anyway, two options. One option, and these are them speaking. It's not me making it up. The two options. One is that the uh, the dinosaurs are running along the ground being chased by somebody, some things, another dinosaur that's going to eat them. They're going to be prey. They're going to be lunch. And so they started running and they got excited and they got nervous and started flapping their arms and boom, they take off into flight. That's that what would they be say. a sight to see, that would, would it be, not? That would be something. Now dinosaurs are now birds. And then the other option is uh, tree dwelling dinosaurs are in the are in the trees and they just decided to jump out of the tree and see what happens. So as they're jumping out of the tree, they're kind of flapping their arms and eventually they just got wings and now they can fly. Well, even mankind knows that if they want to fly, they've got to apply some sort of apparatus to them. Right. People, we just don't start flapping their wings. You would be no. foolish to do that. You to can think go it outside would work. and flap all That's not day science. Long. Yeah, and not no work. one has seen any of this happen. No, but which that's, makes that's it not science. Those are the official two examples. But we've seen it many times in museum displays and such that we've gone to. And those are the two examples of how dinosaurs got wings and turned into birds. And it's nutty. It is nutty. It just it's, seems a bit preposterous. I think you'd have to be a bird brain to believe that. <laughs> it might well be. I don't mean to insult the birds. It's all a lot of science fiction. And we were just talking earlier this morning about how science fiction is only around a century old. The concept, right. the idea, the books, the popularity. And isn't it a convenient it construct? Is a con it is a convenient construct. And now they use it all the time. And apply it to what they call science. But we know that it's evolutionism at its worst. All right. right. Well, hope you enjoyed this. And when you go out and see the birdies and listen to them sing today, thank God for the beautiful creation and the birds that he created. Uh, and I will say one thing else. There's a very famous guy who just went on a, a rocket flight not too long ago. This really famous guy was a uh, captain on a starship that flew around all over the universe and beyond and probably understand who I'm talking about. He did a video clip one time. Somebody did. He was at a, uh, I think a science symposium and somebody asked him a question. You've inspired a lot of people to enter the sciences. How do you balance science with science fiction? Remember his answer? I certainly do. It was. They're both the same. Of course they are. And that's interesting and because I have a science news article, actually several of them, and Arizona State University had come out with this. They're the ones that originated it. They're talking about science fiction and how they're trying to get young kids involved and interested in science fiction. This is in a science publication, how they combine science with science fiction. There's a Cosmology has some big problems article in Scientific American in 2019 that says it's a confusing mix of science and fiction. So the point is they've been applying these tactics for quite some time now. Conveniently. All right. Well, thank you.